we're going to talk about transforming India's cities and politics because the two are deeply intertwined. A few months ago, um, we'd gone to Sydney on vacation. So after uh, traveling around for four days, just a few hours before I was leaving, we were leaving with my family. I was sitting on a bench in Hyde Park. So this is pretty much in the center of the city. And I started looking at the green expanse all around. You know, right there, the botanical gardens and so on, if you've seen uh, Sydney. And the concrete structures all around. And then you realize how wrong we've done in Mumbai. Mumbai is basically a story of unused spaces. Air, land, sea, underground, we wasted all of them. Air, we should have gone vertical. We're starting to do that now, but we've lost 40 years. And that too, through these convoluted slum redevelopment equivalents, or you know, those TDRs equivalent, whatever they call it. On the land, we've not freed up enough space to have parks and commons. Sea and underground, you know, we could have used these for transportation. And we haven't done that. In essence, we've wasted spaces. We've, we've, we've not used ideas which were commonplace three or four decades ago. Imagine what Mumbai could have been had we made the right decisions in the 70s and 80s. A lot of these are workable ideas. The solutions have been known through the decades, but we ignored them all. Like for many of us, Mumbai has been my home. For most of my life, I've lived here. And I've lived in two homes in pretty much the same South Mumbai neighborhood. Very little has changed, really, around there. More taller buildings now starting to come up. Most of life's memories really are embedded in the neighborhood, in the stories, in the homes, in the city that we have lived in. And one starts wondering, you know, why did we not work hard enough to make Mumbai a great city? What has been missing has been the vision and will from both politicians and us citizens. I think we are all responsible for this mess. We've created our little islands, our little cocoons, our sort of gated worlds. It's home, office. For most of us, it's sometimes school, college, but home, office, home, office. Some of the malls on weekends. We have paid very little attention to really building out the city and demanding a livable city with communities. This is what has to change. Transforming Mumbai and other cities is going to require us to change policies and politics. Because bad politics is what has created this mess. Because good politics can get us out of this. And good politics means good policies and voting. Change has to come through our votes. The reality is we don't vote. So who really votes? If you look at the numbers in a city like Mumbai, slum dwellers and the poor make up probably about 65, 70% of the city. They are voting at upwards of 60%. You can do the maths from there on. Middle India, you know, people like us, 30% of us probably, or a little bit less, we are voting at about 25%. Our contribution at the ballot box is less than 20%, closer to probably 15%. It is very little wonder then that we get the policies that we do. Now, the outcome is no surprise. We are writing off our own future. What I'll do later is I'll talk about a solution called United Voters of India that can let us transform our future and our cities. It's an idea to consolidate our votes so that our voices will get heard. But first, let's talk about cities and why we need urbanization. Urbanization and development are conjoined twins. One leads to and means the other. In India, we've had this misplaced notion for a long time, not this romanticism about villages. And that has done us great harm. And I think right from pre-independence days. Now, the future of India is urban. And if you don't believe me, try going out and living in a village for a week. It just doesn't happen. It's not practical. We are not going to do it. But everyone likes this. You know, India lives in 600,000 villages. The reality is that India needs to start living in hundreds of cities. 
Cities are the growth engines. They are there for wealth, wealth creation. They are the innovation hubs and much more. We have seen it through the history of mankind. And we've now got, I think, the, the percentage has crossed 50% of people in the world are living now in, in urban areas. For India to develop, it has to urbanize. Agriculture, labor. Today we have 60, 70% of India involved in agriculture. Agriculture, labor has to shift to low cost, labor intensive manufacturing. India has a unique opportunity here, just like China had 30 years ago. Labor costs have been rising in China. China has moved up the ladder. In the late 70s, India and China had pretty much the same per capita income. Today, China's per capita income is three times that of India. Both started off in 1947-48, you know, around the same time. India could have done what China did in 78 any of those 30 years, but we lost, we lost out on opportunities out there. So labor costs in China have been rising. China itself needs a China of 30 years ago, where they can get low-cost labor, they can get it in large numbers. Chinese companies have been looking at Indonesia and Vietnam and Bangladesh and other such companies trying to move some of its manufacturing out there. India can be that. So that's the only way development happens. You've got to move people out from agriculture. You've got to move them into low-cost manufacturing. You cannot have the migration straight from agriculture to services. You need people in manufacturing because you need to produce things. You need to produce stuff for consumption. India has a unique opportunity to kickstart a 30-year growth cycle like China did, if it can solve its land, labor, and infrastructure problems. But what will this mean? We are going to have, in the next 10 to 15 years, 300 million people, half of our population in agriculture, that needs to move out. They need new cities. They're going to become city dwellers. You already have the migration in small numbers, but that's not good enough to get hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Half of India's agriculture labor has to shift to manufacturing in the next decade. They will need to start living in cities, existing and new. This will be one of the greatest migrations in history other than what, what's happened in China over the last 20, 30 years. And what do we have to offer them? Today, we've got legacy cities, existing cities, but legacy cities like Mumbai. We are bursting at our seams. You look at Mumbai, you look at Delhi, you look at Bangalore, you look at any of these cities. And what is the plan for renewal? It goes by the initials J-N-N-U-R-M. You know, Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission. The only time you see these words are painted on some buses. That's a plan for renewal. That's our plan for revamping cities. In reality, that nothing exists. I had met someone a few years ago, and he said, Rajesh, guess how many urban planners we have for India, for Mumbai? The answer was one. China has got a whole institute producing urban planners for the country. We have forgotten the art of planning, looking ahead 10 to 20 years, what cities need to become, what's the evolution of neighborhoods, what is the progression which we need to have. The reality is that our existing cities cannot accept any more people. What India really needs are new cities. India needs next cities. To house this great migration of people, we have a unique opportunity. We need to construct, in the next 10 to 15 years, 100 new cities. This is one of the biggest infrastructure projects I think any country has probably ever undertaken. But if we don't do this, the consequences are going to be very bad for the country. It is a moment in time that India has to seize for its people and for the world. And what we need are livable, sustainable, well-managed cities. A lot has been written, solutions are out there. We have Paul Romer's concept of charter cities, where people come together based on certain rules. Atanu Deh has talked about designer cities, where cities are planned according to a purpose. But the first problem we have to solve, even when we look at cities, is that of governance, urban governance. And what's needed out here is vision and will for good policies. And it's not going to happen automatically. We've seen the last 60, 65 years, nothing much really has changed. It's almost development or whatever change happens is by default.
It's accidental. Urban governance is our greatest challenge. We need good policies. And for that, we need good politicians. And for that, we need to be able to change the way we vote. And for that, we need to be able to change our minds. Let's first focus on how we are going to change the vote. That's the most important part out of all of these things. The challenge in India is that only 25% of voting happens in, in, in urban middle India. You know, the, the reason is, what difference does my one, one, one vote make? It's a combination of ignorance. I don't know where my polling booth is. It's a question of complacency. You know, it doesn't really make a difference. Apathy, you know, all are equally bad, so it doesn't matter whom I vote for. You know, the other day I heard someone talking about the fact that you know, people don't want to go and wait in a queue. You know, it takes about a minute to cast a vote in a polling booth. There are 10 hours, 600 minutes. A polling booth has about 1,000 voters. We don't see queues in South Bombay because we just don't go out and vote. And the answer is not voting for independent candidates. All that they do is end up being vote cutters. We have to pick and make the two national political parties change. They already have a base. One of them can win. You can vote for independence, but they're not going to go get past the post in our first past the post system. They don't have the collection of votes. Urban middle India cannot form a party of its own and come to power. The numbers are simply not there, and I don't think they'll be there for the next 10, 20 years. It's a hard job creating a national political party to get power to bring about change. But we can, however, swing the vote decisively in favor of one of the two national parties. And that is the, where the solution called United Voters of India comes in. It's an idea proposed by my colleague Atanu De, who's an economist from Berkeley. It basically means it's good governance through participation. We have to vote, and we have to vote as one. It's a concept of an urban, or it's a concept of a voting block. It's not a new concept. We see this all around. You see politicians going to specific communities, to specific neighborhoods, to slum lords, and paying off, or whatever, to get a block of votes. So it's the multiplier effect of votes, and that's where they are then delivered the solutions that they ask for. In the past, politicians have played the game against Middle India. It is time for us to unite. There are now substantial numbers of us. Now we can fight back. And we will get our next big opportunity in the next elections. Just to show a little about how the numbers now can work. In a typical parliamentary constituency, there are 15 lakh votes, 1.5 million votes. Typical voting percentage in urban areas is roughly 50% about seven and a half lakhs. The voting margin is about 70,000, which means if you take Mumbai South, if about 100,000 of us, one lakh people come together, we are the biggest swing vote. You see this happening again and again in the US. You know, whether it's the focus is on the swing states, they're gonna make the difference. The hard supporters on the right and the hard supporters on the left, they're anyway going to vote. What the politicians cater to are the ones in the middle who can swing the election. 2014 can be the game changer election here in India. We can and we have to deliver a majority to one party. Else we can write off good governance for five years. You cannot deliver 160 seats to one party and then have, expect them to work with five mamtas together. <laughs> this can happen and we can make it happen. There are 200 now out of the 543 seats in urban India are now urban to pretty much semi-urban seats. You know, this number used to be Probably if you take maybe uh, four or four, three or four elections together, less than about 100. So 200 out of 543 seats. And if we can use concepts like United Voters of India, we can deliver 175 seats to a single party. And that then can push the tally of that national party past 275. 2014 is not going to be an ordinary election because of the transformation being brought about by the three Ds. Demography, digital, and data. The numbers are there. 25% of India now is urban, uh, are urban voters, 200 out of 800 million voters. Second, they can be reached digitally through internet, mobile, Facebook, and YouTube. The internet population in India, mobile population, mobile internet population in India is at 100 million. Facebook is at 50 million plus. In two years, these numbers will be about 150 to 200 million. Changing minds now is so much easier. And using data, 
where we can do micro-targeting. Focus on the ones who are the non-voters. How do you get them out to vote through concepts like UBI? Technology can be a great ally to get the vote out for the elections. UBI and the three Ds really create the building blocks for making the disruptive force that can transform India going forward. It's only the cities, it's only we people in the cities who can bring about this change through these votes. Rural India is still stuck in time. The voting there still happens based on caste, based on, on transactions. So they're not going to be able to bring about that change. Urbanization is our best path to development. We, the people of urban middle India, are therefore India's only hope for transforming both our politics and our cities. So in short, if we want a better future for ourselves, we need to start now. The combination of cities where we live in today, us being in urban middle India, plus a concept like United Voters of India, where people come together in a constituency and they decide to vote and vote as one. You tell the politicians that if you are not going to do these things for us, if you are not going to have free market policies, for example, if you're not going to have freedom, if you're not going to give us what we want, we are not going to vote for you. And between the competition of two political parties, one of them will realize this voting block is something they cannot do without to win the elections. And that's how change will start happening. India's development is tied to its cities. India's cities need transformation. It need, they need us. UBI is the foundation on which we can build good governance in our cities. And with that, we can get the policies to transform our politics, our cities, and our future lives. I want to make this thing happen. I'm working on, on this concept of United Voters of India. I want to try it out in the next elections. It all started for me when a friend of mine asked a question three years ago. He said, Rajesh, when Abhishek, who was four, my son at that time, when he grows up and he asks you, Dad, you saw all that's happening around. You had the time, you had the money, why didn't you do something about it? What is going to be your answer? For each of us, it's a question we must ask and then act. Thank you.